Watching Talking Points, a focus on the political scene in Lubbock and across the South Plains. I'm so proud of you guys. Little O'Rourke's fans may have loved that, but all the TV channel executives carrying his concession speech live are now hoping they don't have to write a check to the Federal Communications Commission after that little four-letter faux pas on Tuesday. Some have said that O'Rourke's campaign decision not to stay away from talk of impeachment and border security was a faux pas that might have cost him the election. I don't know that I agree with that. I think West Texans like Beto enough to listen to him, but just not enough to vote for him. Money and personality did get him to 51, 48 percent loss, which was a lot closer than a whole lot of people thought that he would ever get to Ted Cruz. Totals like this from Lubbock County kept that from being even closer, frankly. I think Mr. Cruz would do well to remember that for the next six years. Lubbock well, Congressman Jody Arrington will need a Senate ally or two. Mr. Arrington did well Tuesday in his rural and urban areas. Close to the expected win totals there as well. But the second term in Washington, where the Republicans now as the minority party in the House, could make it harder to get the results of his first term. We haven't stopped working, and I will tell you that my message to my team for the last almost two years was, you know, the best way to campaign is just to go to Washington and do your job. But now he doesn't have near the bargaining position for the still pending farm bill as he had a week ago. And that goes for all Republican members of the House now, and probably the president for that matter, who will have his own concerns in the coming months. KMAX Anna Warnick, he spoke with Texas Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar about what he thinks the new Democratic majority's priorities will be when the 116th Congress starts work next year and what it will mean for all Texans. Texas Congressman Henry Cuellar says the people have spoken and Democrats are gearing up for a big year. We're excited to, that the uh, Democrats have taken over the House. I think it's going to provide balance. When the 116th Congress is sworn in, Democrats will hold the majority in the House, which means a change of priorities. Transportation, border security, uh, let's look at maybe the Dreamers. You know, only way we can do the, the, the Dreamers is if we do it in a bipartisan way. Congressman Cuellar says Democrats plan to revisit visit some of the controversial issues Republicans pushed aside this year, like the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program and securing the border without a wall. We want to make sure that we address the issues to have law and order at the border, but not this extreme position. But Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says with a Republican Senate, all deals will have to be bipartisan. We're certainly going to try to help the president. Uh, achieve what he'd like to do with regard to the wall and border security. Democratic strategist Doug Thornell says the two sides weren't forced to work together the past three years. The Republicans abandoned their responsibility to be a check on the president, and I think Repu I think Democrats are going to come in and have a solid uh, agenda of legislation they're going to try to pass, and a lot of it, I think, could be bipartisan. The 116th Congress will be sworn in on January 3rd. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicky. All right, Anna, thank you. Let's spend five good minutes getting some more perspective from Texas Tech Political Science Associate Professor Seth McKees. Good to see you, my man. Thank you. First, from kind of a historic perspective, you know, Republicans losing the House after two years of a Republican president, that's almost expected, right? I mean, that happens a lot. It happens every time but three since the end of the Civil War. So, oh, yeah. yeah, it's almost like clockwork. So it's always something that they have to come back to and, and sort of retool their political fight mm -hmm. for, for, for things. Is there any reason, though, we should not expect Democrats to put their subpoena power to work now on things like getting the president's tax returns or his ethical scandals or whatever comes up in that direction? Yeah, they're going to go that route. And I mean, it was interesting how surprised people were the day after the election that uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions uh, resigned, mm, really was fired. Mm -hmm. um, we saw that coming from a mile away, but still just, I think the audacity of it right after the midterms. So yes, they're clearly with the Democrats in control of the House, they're going to push their, their authority and they're going to subpoena and they're going to get to the bottom of whatever they can. You know, we saw Bill Clinton go to Congress with a hat in hand a little bit after he lost the Congress in 94. Yeah. What does the president do at, at this point to say, okay, are we going to try to get anything done or are we just going to fight for two years? And how does, even more, how does that play with voters? Yeah, not well with voters. Voters can't stand gridlock, but they also, you know, in terms of tribes, there's so many Republicans and Democrats balancing each other out that these things are almost inevitable. So we're sort of in a conundrum. At the same time, I said this the other night that infrastructure, 
Uh, Trump has hinted and flirted with the idea since he got elected and nothing has happened. But now is the, the opportunity. If you want to do something bipartisan, uh, both parties are willing to do that. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure uh, what they would do. Uh, so I think there is an avenue for, for the parties to work together. And if that doesn't happen, is, is impeachment even something that's potentially on the table? Because I, yeah. I think that's something that's coming more from the public, more from the House of Representatives. What do you think here? I, it's a non-starter, and mainly just because the votes aren't there. Right. I mean, you had this, you really did have a blue wave in the House. You know, you're getting close to around 40 seat pickup. Mm -hmm. But the Senate was great for Republicans. They're probably going to end up with 53 seats, so uh, about a two seat pickup. Uh, you got to have two thirds uh, mm -hmm. to remove someone through impeachment in the Senate, and there's just you're not even close to that number. Uh, you'd have to find some major scandal that just sort of pops out into the open for for that to happen. What's your thoughts on on Beto O'Rourke's campaign that seemed to have a lot of Texas moderates rethinking their politics, at least for the sake of personality? At least that's how I took it. What, what do you think? How, how did that end up? You, you know, I think it was really a unique run. Um, and, and so I don't think we could look to Cornyn and think he would be in trouble. I think this was sort of just a set of circumstances where you had, let's admit it, a pretty weak and unpopular incumbent uh, Republican uh, in Ted Cruz. And you had ties that were, on, were running in the Democratic direction. Mm -hmm. And you had sort of a rock star candidate. And he increased turnout so much in Texas, historically speaking, that he changed the, comp the composition of the electorate. Um, so I think there was something just distinct about that run. Um, I think I share the sentiments of a lot of analysts when I say that if Beto had moved a little on some issues to the middle, who knows? Right. You know, maybe we would be in recount territory. But that wasn't his strategy. His strategy was to energize a Democratic base, and, and it is, got him close. Is that a national strategy to stay with that sort of uh, hard I think it could be. Yeah. Uh, you know, after trying Hillary Clinton, who was very centrist in her run, uh, when we think about the Democrats, you know, a lot of the leading names out there are clearly not centrist Democrats. And, you know, we'll have to see, though, uh, maybe Beto does uh, put his hat in the ring and, and go for the big prize. When we sit here again in two years, your opinion here now, will we be talking about hyperpartisan politics or, or is the voting public in danger of hitting a political fatigue wall and just saying, forget it, I'm going to go watch football? No, I think we're probably going to see more of the same uh, just because we don't know how to get out of this dynamic because there's just so much competition. I mean, the either chamber could turn every cycle, the presidency can turn every cycle. Mm -hmm. And so both sides just think, hey, if I can just get a little more of my vote out, I can win this thing. And so as long as that's the case, I think that's what will hold because independents don't win in American politics. Yeah. <laughs> Grab a label and it's either Democrat or Republican. Associate Professor, Texas Tech, Seth McKee. Good to see you again. Thank you. Coming up, the happiest election night party over at Western Bank on Tuesday where supporters of the new Expo Center got word that their plan had won over voters. How will they now set that plan in motion and protect your tax dollars at the same time? Answers next on Talking Point.